This is Mike Fisher, The Fish, and you are plugged into The Step Back, a Mavericks podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of The Step Back, a Mavs podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Trigg. I'm joined as always by my co-host and DallasBasketball.com colleague, Matt Galatson. Uh, We got a lot of good stuff for you tonight. We got our guest, Edward Igros. Uh, he's a CEO of Rev Media, which is part of ePlay. He'll he'll explain to you what he does. He's live from the Final Four tonight, so we're going to talk about the Final Four matchups, uh, NBA prospects playing in those matchups, predictions. Uh, we'll talk about you know uh, Edwards' thoughts on this potentially being Dirk's final season in the NBA with four games left in this season. Then Matt and I are going to discuss Luca's historic rookie season as it's winding down and how he's measured up to our expectations. Uh, which Mavs are going to be Mavs going forward, judging by this current roster. Uh, and we're going to look ahead to the, the two Grizzly games coming up and how that affects the Tankathon race. So we got all that coming up for you. Hang tight, but we can't get this thing started off right. Until we listen to Drew Pop. What you have right now, step back. I like this TK. TK. I like this TK. I like that. Yes, yeah, the Mavericks, all about action. Don't do no acting, no Samuel Jackson. Dirk get the ball, you know that it's magic. Post move deadly, yeah, get tragic. Look with the ball, yeah, get nasty. He'll drop 30. Don't gotta ask him, got Chris Stapps. Coach at the Adam, I spaz like Dallas. Set that I'm rapping, God. If Luca shoot the ball, you know that it's cash. But my boy still living the past. Now he got my boy Chris Stapps. Looking like Dirk and Nash in the gap. They just wanna ring, wanna fill the gap. On your team head, I ain't talking hats. Dang, I'm All right, guys, we've got Edward E. Gross with us tonight. Uh, Edward, how you doing? Doing great, man. Uh, we understand that uh, you're live from the, the Final Four tonight, and uh, you got a lot of stuff going on there. We'll get into the matchups and, you know, some the, the NBA prospects that are playing. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit of uh, a couple of different Mavs topics, too. But before we get started, uh, just tell everybody, you know, what you do and, uh, you know, about the, the database you're, you're promoting and all that stuff. Absolutely. So uh, I guess if, if you don't know by now, uh, I recently left Fox 4 uh, this past weekend. Uh, I was the weekend sports anchor there for five and a half years, and uh, I am now with ePlay. I am the CEO of Rev Media, which is the media component to ePlay. And the simplest way to explain what ePlay does is it is a verified scoring system for basketball games. So every basketball game has to keep score somehow, points, rebounds, assists, etc. And what happens is ePlay takes these scores, verifies it to where scores know what they're talking about, and they're all taken care of. And what happens is uh, then these scores are put into a database, and then they're available uh, as report cards for players and coaches, and they're also used for projection so that you can tell uh, how well these players are going to do for the rest of their career. So let's say you're at a certain tournament and a player is averaging 40 points and 10 rebounds, but you know that the competition in this tournament is relatively weak. Well, right. this database can help identify uh, how weak it is or how strong it might be and then project how well those players are going to do down the road uh, given our own algorithms. And uh, again, I sort of head the media side of things in terms of broadcasting games, telling stories, uh, doing podcasts, all sorts of good stuff. Well, that sounds that sounds extremely cool, and I'm I'm sure a lot of people, yeah. I'm sure that's going to pique a lot of people's interest. Uh, you know, to go check. And that. I want to say too, for anybody who wants more information, make sure I get the plug in. Uh, yeah. For those who want more information, you can go to eplayinfo.com. That is eplayinfo, all one word. dot com. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, definitely go check that out. Uh, and like I said before, you know, Edward, he, he's live from the Final Four. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, you know, found out yet with all the great basketball that went on last weekend, it's Auburn versus Virginia, and it's Texas Tech versus Michigan State. Uh, Edward, what, what are your initial thoughts on, on these two matchups? I mean, what, what do you expect this weekend? Well, let me first start with Texas Tech, and I think, it is very possible that they could be driving what happens here in Minneapolis. And by that, I mean that Jared Culver has the biggest potential of any player remaining in college basketball right now 
to dictate the outcome of the entire tournament. He has the biggest potential to have the most upside, run the Final Four, and win Texas Second National Championship. And he just as likely may get absolutely crushed shooting three for 16 from the floor and lose to Michigan State by 20. It's going to be one or the other. I'm not sure if it's going to be something in between, which is his usual average. Um, First, let's start with Texas Tech. Nobody plays better defense than the group coached by Chris Beard. A phenomenal coach. If you don't know him by now, he's hilarious. Uh, Incredibly sound defensive team. And the Michigan State matchup may be the more intriguing one to me because it's going to be a low-scoring game. It may get a little bit ugly. Um, But that's what you expect from two good coaches and two good teams. Um, This may be the best point guard that Texas Tech has faced to try to defend uh, in Cassius Winston. But at the same time, I don't think Michigan State has seen a defense like this before. So it may very well be the first to 50 wins that contest. So that's the first game. The other game, when it comes to Virginia and Auburn, every single year when it comes to the Final Four, at least seemingly every single year, there's always that one team that seems like a misfit. Last year was Loyola Chicago. Two years ago was South Carolina. George Mason was that team as an 11 seed. And there have been other 11 seeds that have made the Final Four. There's always that one team where you go, why in the world did they make it this far? Whereas the other three seem like appropriate picks or near appropriate picks. This year it's Auburn. They've got a strong backcourt tandem, no doubt about that. But they're going up against Virginia that has something to prove after what happened last year, being the first one seed to lose to a 16. They have NBA talent, no doubt about that. Uh, DeAndre Hunter, if you don't know him by now, the guy is consistently solid. I think one of the reasons why we're not talking about him as a top three NBA prospect is because he's a little bit older than Zion Williamson and John Moran. Um, But the guy could ball, no doubt about that. And the whole team... Uh, you know, it's very strong. They run the shot clock all the way down. They play incredibly good defense, force you into really bad shots. And to me, Auburn should be a significant, or rather Virginia should be a significant favorite over Auburn. The only way Auburn's going to win this one to me is by catching and shooting a lot of threes uh, at a stadium that isn't going to provide the best of sight lines. So Auburn's at a major disadvantage at this one, as are usually the teams that are the misfits making the Final Four. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we've seen some wacky things happen in this tournament. So, Edward, uh, back back to the Texas Tech game. Um, they've been, like you said, absolutely incredible on defense throughout this tournament. They they held, yeah, I mean, they, they've been outstanding. I think the last team they played, they held to 16 or 17 points in the first half or something like that. It was crazy. So, so what is the shut down the number one offense in Gonzaga in the last game, and that I thought was not going to happen at all. It, 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 Gonzaga's got NBA talent, and nobody scored better than them. And yet, Tech completely grinded them all the way down to a nub in the second half. It was just incredible to watch. Well, yeah, so my question is, what has been the secret to Chris Beard's defense that has frustrated these other teams in the tournament so much? I think I think a lot of it is simply coaching. Uh, I, I think it, it, it begins with uh, recruiting guys who are able to be coached. Um, I think it's also forcing guys to get late in the shot clock and force up bad shots. I think there's that. Uh, they certainly collapse down low. They've got good size, got good wingspan. I think you add all of that up, and you've got a pretty good recipe. Um, you know, Chris Beard has been doing this for a while now. Um, maybe he hasn't had the talent he's wanted. Uh, maybe he's needed his own tournament seasoning. But the guy is 8-2 and two at Texas Tech in the NCAA tournament. That's not by accident. This is somebody who knows what he's doing, who's seen a variety of different good offenses and always comes prepared to shut him down. Um, it's, it's been incredible to watch, and given the length that he has now, uh, given how fast this team can run, um, and sometimes, too, teams can get a little hesitant offens- offensively when they know that the other team has somebody who can you know, run a fast break in some capacity or is able to make you pay if uh, you force a turnover. Um, it, it's, it's been incredible to watch. Yeah, and Edward, I, just going back to the, the Virginia-Auburn game, uh, you know, they, they lost Okiki. That was a huge loss for them. But, you know, it. Yeah. You know, when a guy goes down like that and you're that far into the tournament – it's so emotional, and in some cases, it can kind of bring the team together and give them a uh, give them an emotional push. Uh, you know, a little bit more want to, I guess. That you know, to try and uh, 
pull one out for their their fallen teammate or something. So I think Auburn's got a little bit of that going for them. But Virginia, they're the best three point shooting team percentage wise out of the four teams uh, in the Final Four. And I mean, I I think that's probably going to end up being the better game. Just just my opinion. But I mean. I think the way Auburn is playing it, and with uh, Okiki going down and them still finding a way to get it done, I, I, it almost feels like they're destined to get there. So we'll 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 see. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, that that's what we were going to talk about next. Is you know who who do you ultimately see making it to the championship game, and uh, who who do you think brings it home? Well, I think first off. I, uh, we have certainly been doubting Auburn all season long, no doubt about that. And I don't think uh, it would do them justice to completely dismiss them against uh, what is the number one team in Kim Pom right now in Virginia. Uh, they have NBA talented players. Uh, Auburn at this point really doesn't. Um, I think it's more coaching in what Bruce Pearl has done that's gotten Auburn this far. I'm not exactly sure there's one or two players uh, who have been able to carry the load, as it were. Uh, certainly an emotional boost helps, uh, but that can only get you so far. Right. And, you know, again, look at Virginia last year versus this year. We, we keep talking about, you know, underrating Virginia because of what happened the year before losing to a 16 seed. Well, a lot of it is offensively, they're a heck of a lot better than they were last year. And a lot of it is because of the three balls you mentioned. Kyle Guy, incredibly strong catch and shoot guy who, pun intended, who, look, if he was not getting hot at just the right time against Purdue, Purdue would have run him out of the gym. And then we would be talking about a very different game and a very different matchup. Um, that Virginia found a way to win, I think, proves that they have the grit necessary to withstand any run that may happen by Auburn's backcourt. So in that regard, I like Virginia in that one. As far as the other one is concerned, to me it's all dependent upon Jared Culver. If he starts, if he starts going off and knocking down big shots left and right, Tech can win the national championship, no doubt about it. I just like Michigan State a little bit more for the seasoning and by what Cassius Winston could do. Point guard play matters in the tournament, no doubt about that, especially if you have a few years under your belt. Michigan State has that weapon available to them. So I like Virginia and Michigan State, the national championship. And, you know, this one could be really close. We could have a really exciting Monday night. I'm going to give the edge to Michigan State at this point. But maybe it's subject to change uh, if Virginia shows me something in that last game because I expect a really exciting finish. Well, I I personally I I joined two bracket pools this year. One of them is an absolute mess. I have no chance of winning anything. The other one, however, all all I have to do to win is have Virginia go to the to, to the championship game. They don't have to win it; they just have to get there. So. <laughs> oh, man, I'm completely out of all of it. I I don't even want to look at it anymore. <laughs> but uh, but just branching off of that, you know, I I don't know, uh, you know, just how closely you've uh, you know, stayed connected to the Mavs this year, as far as you know, the the tanking stuff, the organic tanking, as we like to call it at DallasBasketball.com. But uh, you know, you obviously, are disciples of fish, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, I hear that phrase. And I'm like, I know who you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so obviously, there's only four games left. Uh, the Mavs have to secure a, a top five pick to keep their pick this year. If not, it goes to the Atlanta Hawks. So. Uh, right now, they're flirting with sixth and seventh as far as the odds goes and all that. But if they do get a top five pick, if they get number one, we know it's Zion Williamson. Or I'm sure everybody assumes 99% it's it's Zion going one. If it's two through four or two through five, you know who are I think the top two players to watch as far as. Uh, you know, picks in that range this weekend are uh, two players you've already talked about in Jarrett Culver and DeAndre Hunter. So I was just I was just going to get your thoughts on how those two players, in your opinion, would fit in with what the Mavs are trying to do now. Well, I would also add uh, John Morant to that mix as well. I think he's a guy out of Murray State who was very much unheralded out of high school and then all of a sudden uh, came in like gangbusters. Incredible assist guy, to say the least. I mean, his passing is second to none. Um, and I would, I would include him in, in sort of that two or three spot. Um, 
so tankathon.com, great website that sort of keeps up with the math uh, when it comes to the lottery odds of uh, the Mavs uh, getting one of those uh, top four spots. Uh, five mathematically isn't going to happen, but the top four are done uh, through lottery picks. And uh, I think the Mavs are around a one out of three chance of getting one of those top four spots. And to me, uh, one, two, or three, Zion, Ja, Jared, I think any one of those can help. I think some could help more than others. If it's four, though, I would trade the pick. I would absolutely trade the pick. I don't know if anybody beyond three is going to give you a significant advantage. And not to mention, look, a little bit of veteran presence on this team wouldn't be a bad thing for Luka. And I think the only reason why you would keep one or two, maybe three, is because the talent is just too strong. I mean, certainly, if somehow the Mavs get Zion, uh, which I think there's only an 8% chance of that happening. But if it does... You take the pick. You don't get stupid about it, right? Uh, but other than that, that's uh, a game you know, changer. Certainly, an absolute game changer. All of a sudden, you have two or three superstars on your team, and you are set. And a lot of decent role players. All of a sudden, the Mavericks are gonna get to the playoffs, and it's just a matter of what seed they're gonna be finishing in. You know, certainly the Warriors are ridiculous. The Rockets are very good. The Nuggets are interesting. So I- I'm not ready to say they're a top three seed in the West. Uh, just because they add Zion, but uh, you know, man can dream, I suppose. Right. But I, I look at all of this. Uh, I, I look at all of this and say, look, you know, John can be a great distributor of the basketball. That's going to be important. Uh, you know, his assist total is going to be through the roof. Uh, he will be a defensive liability, though, and so that's going to be a big question. He will be a defensive liability for a long time in the NBA. That's why you know, he's not a number one guy. Uh, Jerry Culver, you know, he's going to be able to play defense, no doubt about that. It's just offensively, is he going to get cold, and what do you do about that? He's not going to be a superstar in the NBA, but he can't be very serviceable. Uh, Downright solid, I'd say. Um, He can add a presence to the Mavericks that maybe they don't have. But again, the the blueprint for finding something to work with Luka is the right play to make in this situation. And so even if you do get a top-four pick, three or four perhaps, uh, I would not be opposed to trading it. I think I think a veteran presence would be great, freeing up some money uh, to get a highly touted free agent, perhaps a big man down low would be terrific. Um, I I would seriously consider that and not feel compelled to constantly get younger and younger because at some point somebody has to know what to do. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in just a bit, but you know, Luca does need a little bit of tutelage. I mean, he's still a phenomenal player, but sometimes an older guy, uh, you know putting him around the arm, around the shoulder, and just say, look, do this, do that, can be a helpful thing. Right, yeah, and I mean, you can, uh, that's what makes us, makes us in, we're in awe of Luca, what he's been able to accomplish this year, you know, he's 20 years old now, he's only one of five players in the NBA, you know, averaging what he's averaging right now, uh, it's him, Giannis, Antetokounmpo, LeBron James, Blake Griffin, and Russell Westbrook. That's it. That's the only five players averaging that. So, and he still has so much left that he can he can learn. I mean, he can grow from this, sure. and uh, the, the the sky is the limit as far as I'm concerned. So, I would I would in terms of sky being the limit, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. But I think what I would be careful of is that all of a sudden he's going to be a 40, 20, and 20 guy all of a sudden. Like, I mean, that's never going to happen. Right. <laughs> I think what we can see is a more efficient Luka Doncic where we're not going to be seeing more of those plays. We will be we will be seeing his minutes uh, managed a lot better. I think we'll see him have his highlight plays, not necessarily on a more frequent basis, but we won't see the bad plays as much. Right, Le- less fatigue, too. The numbers too. may go up a little bit. But, yeah, it, I, to me, his up – his – room for growth involves efficiency it's not frequency well edward i I think we'll finish off with this but you know obviously part of that veteran presence that we all think luca needs is um is dirt Nowinski, and everyone's preparing whether he's announced it or not everyone's preparing as if he is about to you know retire just in case so we just want to get your thoughts on uh, the season that Dirk's had, you know, coming off the injury and, you know, just what you're going to be looking for in these last four games that he's going to be playing. You know what? It, 
it may be sort of a cop-out answer, and forgive me for that, but I'm not sure that what I see in the final four games will dictate Dirk's 21-year legacy, much less dictate uh, what he will decide to do. Um, I think in large part it's going to be health. Uh, as you said before, does he feel well enough? Uh, if he avoids injury these last four games, then I certainly could see him uh, do a 22nd season. Um, it may also matter what happens in the draft. If somehow they get fortunate uh, with the lottery or a uh, big-name free agent comes to town, you may say, you know what, this team is capable of making a run in the playoffs. I want to be a part of it. I mean, the thing about Dirk is, I and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know what he does away from playing basketball, what activities he gets involved in. Certainly he's a loyal family man, no doubt about that, and he loves his family, but he's not involved in so many different projects that could compel him to retire. This is a basketball guy, to say the least. And so I think it's why I have become more and more convinced that a 22nd season is at least possible. Uh, certainly at the start of the year, it seemed impossible, but given the fact that he's been able to, you know, still retain that beautiful jump shot, that one legged fadeaway is still occasionally there. Uh, you know, we'll drive once in a blue moon. I mean, he's capable of doing all these things in, in limited, in a limited capacity. It's just going to be a matter of health, uh, where the Mavericks stand, uh, throughout the off season. Uh, and if he wants to put up with it, I mean, Rick Carlisle knows how to manage his minutes and his games, no doubt about that. And the NBA has done a better job of limiting back to backs to the point where he's not going to be overwhelmed with what's expected of him. And he's already had one year of knowing what it's like to come off the bench. So I add all of that up and go that this is going to be an interesting, interesting storyline uh, this off season. And I would not be surprised one way or the other how it turns out. Absolutely. Yeah, look, I've, you know, we, we've just recently started following each other on Twitter. And so you'll, you'll find this out very soon. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably one of the more optimistic Mavs people out there. I, I honestly think he's coming back for a 22nd season. He's looked the best he's looked all year. You know, he missed 26 games earlier in the year. Uh, I think he, if he stays healthy, if nothing you know freaky happens these last few games, I think he's going to come back next year just for one more you know one more season. Next year will definitely be it. But uh, Edward, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking with us again. His name is Edward Egros. He's uh, the CEO of Rev Media, part of the ePlay family that's building the world's premier basketball database. Edward, we appreciate it, and uh, you'll have to come on some other time with us. Gentlemen, it was a real pleasure, and uh, just say the word, and I'll be there. Sounds good, man. Thanks, Edward. Edward. We sure do appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, guys, we're going to take a little bit of a break here. When we come back, we're going to discuss Luka's historic rookie season as it's winding down. Uh, We're going to talk about which current Mavs are going to be on the Mavs roster next season and we're going to look ahead to the Grizzlies series this weekend they have a home and home we're going to look at that and uh, discuss what it means for the tankathon race so hang tight we'll be right back all right guys we're back Uh, Matt and I we're going to talk about Luka Doncic and his historic rookie season Uh, there's four games left and right now Luka is averaging 21.2 points per game 7.7 rebounds per game and 5.9 assists per game Uh, the only on the list of players that have an average of at least 21 7 and 5 this season Matt here's the list it's Giannis Antetokounmpo LeBron James Russell Westbrook Blake Griffin and Luka Doncic that that's a pretty impressive list and just looking at that it makes you it makes you wonder how this guy missed out on making the all-star team this year but uh, what, what's your what's your reaction to that list <laughs> well those are some decent players huh yeah I mean it's pretty cool uh, I think the reason he missed the all-star game was purely political to be honest. Um, yes. You know, Anthony Davis probably shouldn't have been playing. I still don't think LeBron James, after sitting out all those games, should have been on the all-star team, but he was the lead vote-getter, so whatever. Um, 
But hey, here's another cool stat. Uh, our our good friend Mark Followell tweeted uh, Lucas twenty seven points last night. With that, he assured he's assured an average of at least twenty points, seven rebounds, and five assists per game, which only Oscar Robertson in 1960-1961 has accomplished. So that kind of puts into perspective the kind of rookie year that he's having. And it's um, crazy. And it's insane. And I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up real quick as I'm talking, but uh, Oscar Robertson. You see, you said that was in 1960. Yeah, the 1960-61 okay, so, season. Okay, so in 1960, Oscar Robertson, he was the last rookie to do that, and he was playing 42.7 minutes per game. And oh. <laughs> Luca, <laughs> and Luca, he is playing a little over 32 minutes. Yeah, 32.2 minutes per game. So. Robertson was playing over 10 minutes per game more back then. And, I mean, obviously his stats were incredible. Uh, but, I mean, it just kind of shows you what Luka can do. He can do so much uh, in less time. And, you know, I, I've been uh, – I've had the opinion that once he gets his NBA body, you know, once he hopefully spends this upcoming off season, uh getting in better NBA shape – and he can, you know, his stamina will be up and all that. I think he'll be able to sustain uh, more of the the greatness we saw, especially early on in the season. Because you know he, even though he's he's kind of he's he's been in a couple of slumps here lately, he's still amazing. So I mean, if he can get to a point where he's not, you know, wearing down towards the end of the season and looks like he has tired legs and all that he's going to be a a a terror on the court you know it's it's kind of like I've been telling you this you know pretty much all season Matt he's Euro (laughs) Braun that's a little that's a little premature but okay I don't think it's premature and I'm not I'm not obviously LeBron is supremely athletic compared to to Luca he's I'm not saying Luca's going to be that I'm just saying, you know, he he dominates a game in the same way as that LeBron does. And I think that, you know, as with LeBron, if they put, you know, uh, a bunch of three-point shooters around him, that's where he'll really be the most effective. But yeah, man, he he is he's exceeded my expectations and he was number 1 on my draft board last year, so I already had really high expectations. But it's been amazing. I mean, we've we've witnessed uh, NBA history this year. Uh, you know, he uh, he's on the list with Magic Johnson for the third most triple doubles and uh, in NBA history as a rookie. I mean, it, anything you can you can name off, he's he's probably done it this year. I mean, it's it's just been amazing to watch. Well, as far as the triple doubles go, there's also been like quite a few occasions where he's been one assist or one rebound or whatever away from having another triple double and That's right. you know the the player he passed you know passed the ball to on the last shot didn't make it or you know he didn't have good shooters around him or DeAndre Jordan was stealing rebounds from him at, at one point <laughs> good times good so, times so uh i mean that's that's all great uh honestly though before the season started i did a scouting report uh, of Luka uh about a year ago almost uh, it was in april of last year and uh, you can go search for it on DallasBasketball.com. I've tweeted it a few times. Uh, so as soon as I watched it, like literally the first thing I tweeted was, "I am in basketball love with Luka Doncic," and I wanted him <laughs> so bad. But I didn't think it. I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was possible. I re- and my comp. I remember that. My comp in that story in that scouting report was uh, Euro James Harden, and everybody thought I was insane. And now all the you know the big media, ESPN and all that are saying, well, he's James Harden, like he's James Harden, like I'm like, hey, I had it first, dude. Right. Give me some, <laughs> give me some credit, because you know I, I was saying this before anybody was. But yeah, I got I got to give you credit on that one. You you definitely called that, you know, right off the bat, and I remember you getting some flack for that too. But uh, I mean, talking about James Harden, I we talked about this last night, but. You know, uh, Bob Volgaris, he's been active on Twitter lately, and 
it's not, you know, it's not basketball related all the time, but something that caught my eye, you know, he was talking about how uh, there's a lot of people that think ISO basketball, you know, isn't an efficient way of playing, but he was just like, uh, yeah, it is, as long as you surround whoever the, the ISO guy is with four, you know, really good three-point shooters. And, you know, since he's since he's basically advising the Mavs front office now, uh, it kind of gives you a little glimpse of his way of thinking and, you know, what we can expect from the, from the Mavs going forward. Because, I mean, I definitely think they're going to use Luka like James Harden. His game is already similar to James. Uh, now they're just, they just got to get the personnel around him, you know, to get the most out of it. Right, and that'll be the real key because – as it stands right now, and really, it's has as it's been for the whole season. He ha- he does not have efficient shooters around him. I think had they been able to bring back Doug McDermott and had K- or KP had been able to play, or if they had played freaking Ryan Brokoff more minutes, who has been fantastic by the way, they he would have had even better numbers. But you know, as it stands. He's just had a bunch of extremely inefficient shooters and, like, Jalen Brunson. Especially with Tim Hardaway out, who's not, you know, an efficient shooter by any means, but he was one of the better three-point shooters on the team, and now he's out. And so it's just a lot of mixing and matching with, you know, whatever they've got that got there, got there out there on the court. I mean, maybe he needs to find Sala some more. He's been killing it from three. <laughs> that has one, that's been one of the coolest developments uh, down the stretch of this season, just seeing Salah pull up and take whatever three he wants. I mean, the, in that last game, the, you know, the Mavs just lost a nail biter to the the Timberwolves the other night. He took a three in crunch time. I, I'm pretty sure they it was a tie game, and he took a three from the corner, <laughs> and there wasn't much time left. And I was thinking, like, they're really doing this. <laughs> Like, they're just that, letting him go. That is organic tanking, if I've ever heard it. But, yeah. I mean, it, it didn't work out. <laughs> it's like, hey, Sala, just go shoot some threes. We've been telling you to work on it. And by I mean, God, look, they're going in. I mean, look, I, I know I know you're, like, you're cringing every time the Mavs even get close to winning right now. But if he had hit that three and they had gone on to win that game, I mean, all, <laughs> you, you just I have, have to been tip so your, pissed. your hat, man. <laughs> no, I would have been so pissed. <laughs> I mean, like, of course, Sala is the reason that they're not going to keep their top five pick. <laughs> it's kind of like that year, uh, a couple years ago, you know, I remember, and th- this involved the Grizzlies too, and we'll talk about these important Grizzly games coming up this weekend here in a second, but uh, a couple years ago before the uh, the 2017 draft, I remember, I don't remember exactly where they were in the, uh, the, the tankathon race, but... I remember they had a really important game against the Grizzlies. I think it might have been the last game of the season. I'm not sure. Uh, all I do remember is Devin Harris went off and willed them to victory in that game. And I remember Mavs Twitter just being a dumpster fire after that. And then, you know, hindsight is 2020, obviously. But uh, after they won that game, you know, they moved up a spot from where they should have been in the lottery if they had lost it well that that spot i think it was the kings that moved up and they drafted fox so that (laughs) that's how that's how bad their their lottery luck has been you know throughout their history but that's the most recent case of it they they won that grizzlies game when they probably shouldn't have and it resulted in them taking dennis smith jr at ninth you know, instead of uh, moving up. Dude, that's why, like, every time they've won, like, they went on this three-game streak, and that's why I was so depressed. It's like (laughs) any other season, like, in the future, I am going to cheer for every Mavericks win I can. But, like, this one, it's just like, what are you doing? Like, I get, get, like, the Golden State one. Like, that was a 35-point blowout. You can't help that. But, like, it's the Oklahoma City one, especially, that, like, kind of creeped in and was like... Mad, come Dude, on! I mean, I don't care. I don't care. Tr- it's not like they You can't blame the Mavs for winning a game when these other teams. I'm not are just mad at the Mavs, like, but I'm not mad at the Mavs. I'm mad that the that the Mavs are playing these teams that just so happen. It's like it's it's just luck. Like 
or bad luck. Like they just so happen to have some of the wor- their worst nights of the season, like these three playoff teams when they play the Mavericks. Like what the hell? That is such bad luck. That like that's what sucks. Even that Sixers game that they won here recently, you know, they Embiid and uh, Jimmy Butler didn't play in that game, but I mean, you still because had of Tobias. Course. Yeah, but you, I mean, they still had Tobias Harris. They still had Ben Simmons. They had JJ Redick. I mean, they they had yeah. some good players on there. But I mean, you can't. That just came out of nowhere when the Mavs outscored them. I think it was like forty-two to well, seventeen in the second quarter. When I found out that Embiid wasn't playing in that game. Like, Jimmy Butler is one thing, but when they don't have Embiid, they're a totally different team. So, like, I think Ben Simmons is kind of overrated. So, like, him and Tobias Harris, I don't think would have been been enough to beat most teams on any given night. Like, I you think know, I think the combination of, of, of Luka and... I mean, I, I think Luka and Jalen Brunson and Dwight Powell is a better trio than Tobias Harris and Ben Simmons is a duo, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't want to get too off topic here, but just branching off of uh, of what we talked about earlier with, you know, Luca being uh, optimized by having four shooters around him. That is especially the case with Ben Simmons, you know, because he he can't shoot at all. So I mean, he at all he definitely needs the other four guys around him to be able to shoot, uh, you know, to make it to where he's the most efficient form of himself but you know Luca if they if they ended up only getting you know two or three guys around him like that he'd be fine because he can create his own shot and he can shoot a little bit but it definitely the case with with Ben Simmons uh that's the way you have to build around him but uh you know I'm looking at the Mavs roster right now and uh, we're just going to kind of – I'm going to go down this list on basketballreference.com and we're just going to answer yes or no, both of us, to each player on, you know, which Mav we think will continue to be a Mav going into next season. So let's start with with the obvious ones here. So Luka Doncic, yes. Yes. Christoph Porzingis, yes. I hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say yes because he's, I mean, he's a restricted free agent. And, I mean, worst case, the worst case scenario, which, you know, with all the other stuff going on, it that's that's actually the worst case scenario if something bad happens there. But yeah. just con- contractually speaking, uh, the worst case scenario is he takes the qualifying offer and he's only on the team for, you know, one season. Which so, no which no guy coming off of his rookie contract has ever done in NBA history. Yeah, that's so. that's that's not gonna happen. So he's not gonna turn down that max money. You know, if the Mavs try to get cute and they try to, you know, lowball him or something, that might be different, but they're not gonna do that either. He's gonna get offered his bag, he's gonna accept it. And he's going to be here long term. So no, okay. Let's let's keep going down the list here. <clears throat> JJ Barea. Uh, I'm going to say yes, and this is going to go for a couple players on this list. I'll, but I'll start with, with JJ because uh, you pointed it out earlier to me and uh, and Kirk on Twitter. Uh, Mark Cuban has a lot of loyalty, so I think yes. JJ is going to feel the effects of that and be part of the roster despite what most of us right. would want. And and you know, I like uh Tim McMahon was saying shortly after that injury uh happened, you know, Berea is one of those players that you don't want to count out because his career is kind of miraculous as it is, you know, given his height and uh, his path to the NBA. So, I mean, he's defied the, the odds his whole career. So, he's one person you don't want to really count out. And if he can if he can get right, uh, I, I mean, I, I can see him coming back on like a, a veteran minimum, minimum contract. So, I'm going to say yes for Berea, too. All right, Dwight Powell. Uh, I'm going to say no because I'm gonna say I yes. don't want it to happen. You don't want it to happen. I'm going to say yes. Now, I don't know. You know, I know there's been some talk about Mark Cuban saying that uh, he wants to give Powell an extension. or uh, I don't necessarily know if that's going to happen. But, you know, I, I do think he's going to be on the team 
whether they do that or he opts in uh, one way or the other, he's going to be on the team going into the next season. Now, he may not stay on the team throughout the season, but he he will start the season Fair on enough. the Mavericks. All right, Dorian Finney-Smith. I, I've changed my stance on this. I'm going to say no. Uh, I'm going to say yes because I think they really need to keep him because he's the one semblance of good defense they have on the roster right now. Well, the reason Besides I say no – <laughs> I want to keep Finney Smith. I want to keep Finney Smith and uh, Kleba, but you know you can kind of see how his his role has uh, you know diminished a little bit in the latter part of the season. Now whether that's the Mavs, you know, trying to keep his market value down or or something like that, you know, I I can't speak for that, but I mean it, it that could be the case. But it just kind of feels like Justin Jackson has just kind of you know taken over. Uh, the role that that your Finney pet, Smith, your pet cat, he's my favorite Mavs cat meme. I'll I'll put it that way. <laughs> but you you got Justin Jackson next. I I think he's going to be on the team because, yes. like I said, I I think he's I think he's kind of taken over uh, Finney Smith's role. I think it, I think you could keep both, but I don't think it's going to happen. Courtney I would, Lee, I would love to keep both those guys first of all, but yes, Courtney Lee, no. Courtney Lee, no, I agree with that. Uh, Maxi Kleba, I say yes. yes. He, they have to keep him. I, I don't see any way around that. For sure. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. You first. <laughs> I say yes, and I mean I, I know you probably you're gonna want to say no on this one too, but I'm gonna say yes just because I don't. It's kind of like the Wes Matthews thing, even though he's younger than Wes and. Uh, more athletic and all that. I mean, it's kind of like the West deal. We had him uh, for four seasons, and, you know, it seems like every year we were talking, oh, we, we're going to trade West. We're going to trade. And we couldn't even trade him until halfway through the final year of his deal. So uh, it's just it's easier said than done. I don't think they'll be able to do it. They'd have to, you know, get lucky in the lottery, get their pick, and probably give that pick to somebody to offload him. And I just – I, I'm not I'm not even going anywhere near that. So I think he'll definitely be on the roster. Yeah, I I really don't want to believe it, but um I think he probably will be too. It's just too it's gonna to be really hard to move his contract. Um I don't know that I it depends who you would get back in return for trading like the number two pick and Tim Hardaway Junior and something else. But I, I just don't see it. Yeah, and and uh, just for just for the record, we're not going to include Costas and uh, Daryl Macon on this because they're the the two way players. I I think it's safe to say unless they find somebody they think is more worthy of that two way contract uh, in the in the draft, the undrafted players, uh, they're probably going to stay for their second season on the two ways so we're not going to include them in this but anyway going off at of least, that at least Costas but yeah yeah uh Trey Burke uh unfortunately I don't I, I would love to have him back but uh especially with the way he's been playing lately but I just think he's he's going to be one of the guys on the roster that's going to kind of get you know squeezed out because yeah. of other moves they're trying to make well and like we said you know if, if Berea if he comes back and uh you know he looks like he's ready to contribute similar to how he was before he went down with the injury, uh, there's really not there's really not a good place for Trey Burke, which is unfortunate because, like you said, he's been playing great. Uh, he's been a spark plug coming off the bench. Uh, so I think – I say no, too. I, I think he eventually gets squeezed out. Uh, Ryan Brokoff, I say yes. I have a hard time seeing it. I just think he's another one of those guys that might get squeezed out. But I would like to get him back, and I would like for him to get more minutes. Yeah, uh, he's yeah, been he, really think, good. Yeah, I think he definitely needs to needs to get some more minutes. That's probably one of the biggest, you know, complaints with Rick Carlisle this season. Uh, the way he's been playing lately, you know, I, I put the numbers on Twitter the other day. I did a, a basketball reference player comparison with Ryan Brokoff and Doug McDermott and he's actually been a better shooter 
than Doug McDermott this year. Now he he hasn't uh, you know shot as much as Doug, but he doesn't play as many minutes either. But you know the per thirty six minutes are neck and neck. Um, I think if they can get him back on a vet minimum minimum deal, uh, he will be back. Uh, Jalen Brunson, yes, of course. Obviously, I mean, yes. Yeah, he might on. start. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, he and I mean that. Judging uh, or basing his off season or looking forward to his off season and you know what we expect him to improve on going into his second season, that that might not be a bad thing depending on who uh, the Mavs can add in free agency. All right, Devin Harris, we're winding down here. Uh, he said on Twitter recently that he would love to come back, and. Um... I'm sorry, Devin, you've been a great Maverick, but I don't think you're going to be on the roster. It's just yeah, like I, they, 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 if, they, if they really want to sign some big free agents this summer and kind of remake the roster, they got to start making some hard decisions, and I think he's going to be one of those hard decisions. Yeah, yeah, just like it was a hard decision to trade him uh, last season, I think it's, it's probably the end because – like I said, they're in a situation now, especially if they keep their pick, and they they might not do that, but if they keep their pick, and especially if it's number one and you get Zion, but uh, if something like that happens, all of a sudden you're an even more attractive free agency destination. Uh, you have a chance to make a big splash there, even if you don't land, you know, some of the top tier guys, the second tier guys, or you know, you're you're gonna come out of free agency a lot better than what you were beforehand. And I just, I don't know, with the emergent of, emergence of Jalen Brunson this season and some of the other guys, I just, I don't see where Devin Harris fits in going forward. So I'm going to say no. And last but finally, you know, not least here, Dirk Nowitzki. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to do that to you, but I mean, he's, he's last on the list here. I mean... I don't think he's coming back, man. I'm sticking to it. I've 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 been saying it for a while now. I just from what Dirk has said, he is going to look at to evaluate whether he's going to come back or not, which is, you know, how he feels and his body holding up and all that versus what the eye test shows me him being better towards the end of this season like he has been. And then he's he's also said that he's felt better now than he has all year. So knowing what Dirk has said, like, okay, if this happens, that's going to determine whether I come back or not or going to play a big factor in it. I think he's coming back. Uh, I don't know for how much. I mean, if, if all goes well, like I said, with the draft and, and free agency, and all that, it's probably a vet minimum deal. Uh, if not, I could see them giving him like the, the mid-level exception or something like that. But, yeah, I think he's going to be back. If not, I'm going to be very depressed, you know, for <laughs> for, a, for a period in time this summer. But um, I'm sticking to it right now. I think he comes back. Okay. And uh, we're going to have one final season. Okay. Well, here's my thing. Um, I wouldn't be this like apathetic about it <laughs> or not apathetic but depressed about it and you know it. <clears throat> the only thing is I heard Steve Nash the other night say well this is going to be my last chance to see Dirk on the floor and I think if anybody knows what Dirk's really thinking right now it's probably Steve Nash and just the whole idea of him being such so close with Dirk and then not really being right he didn't really say he's retiring but he kind of like he kind of insinuated like yeah this is going to be my last chance so I had to come out here like I think that's just really eaten away at me so it makes me believe that Dirk's not coming back but I mean maybe he will and I hope I eat crow on that but I just I right now I don't see it yeah, I mean, I mean, look, there's a reason people are, are you know, starting to come to games and you know making these comments like this is it and everything. Cause, uh, there's a reason nobody's ever played 22 seasons in the NBA because it <laughs> it's really hard to do that. Uh, so I mean, if he does decide to hang it up, 
I'm not going to be shocked by that. I know it's it's a very real possibility. I just think the Porzingis trade made it more likely and him feeling the way he does at the end of the season and knowing that he missed a good chunk of what was, you know, potentially his last season. Both of those things I think will push him to come back because we know we know KP and uh, and Luca are you know probably in the back saying come on uh, you know <laughs> come back with us one more year and uh, call it quits after that so we'll we'll see I mean I I'm not going to be shocked either way but I'm I'm hoping for the best. Okay, but, so, so if I'm clear on this, so you have uh, Courtney Lee and Trey Burke. And Devin Harris is the only ones that won't be back. Uh, let me see here. Yes. Oh, and Dorian. You you said Dorian's not going to be back. Okay, so you have four four guys that won't be back. I just think there's going to be more turnover than that. I don't know. At least I hope there is. Well, but. you could, you could, uh, you could probably put Broke off in there. Uh, you could probably put. You could probably put Berea in there because that there's nothing guaranteed, you know, with his recovery or anything like that. He he may not be what <laughs> he may not be to a point where he can play uh, up to his usual level next year. So I mean, you don't know. Uh, so there's a couple in there that I said yes on, but you know, it could really go either way. Um, I yeah. do, th- I you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. I think he's definitely staying. Powell, I said yes on him too, but. Even if he does opt in, uh, you know, he he could be traded. So uh, that's a little bit different situation than the Tim Hardaway Jr. thing. He's definitely not untradeable. Uh, so, I mean, there, it's a lot of flexibility there. But I'm, I'm like you. It, you'd think there would be a lot of turnover, but we'll just have to see how the lottery goes and how the draft goes and free agency, and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. <clears throat> yeah. But – um, we'll close with this. Uh, we we got to talk about the the upcoming uh, home and home series with the Mavs and the Grizzlies. Right now, the Mavs and Grizzlies are both thirty one and forty seven. They both have four games left. They're tied for the six best odds in the lottery, and <laughs> perfect timing. They've got two head to head matchups. So, I mean, who do you think comes out on top? after this weekend so to speak <laughs> if the Mavericks don't lose both of these games <laughs> I give up like I, I seriously give up like you you know how <laughs> depressed I've been over this whole thing like just so everybody knows it had the Mavericks lost to those three playoff teams like they have been doing all season they would be ahead of Atlanta for the fifth pick now Right. So I'm just throwing that out there. I know they. I know it's it, it's not something they can control. Well, so to speak, look, but whatever. But they better look, lose I, these games. I think. I don't. I don't know if they'll lose both. I think. I think a split's probably the best bet at this point. But uh, I could see them losing both games, and that would be the best case scenario for their, you know, for their lottery odds and everything but look it's not just between them and the grizzlies anymore because right behind them you have the pelicans at 32 and 47 you have the wizards at 32 and 47 so both of those teams are just a half game back so i mean you've got the sixth the seventh the eighth and the ninth spots completely wide open with four games left so i mean this this is going to get crazy it's a huge weekend uh for the mavs you know, lottery odds. If they if they go zero and two, if they lose these two games to the Grizzlies, I think you can pretty much lock them into that sixth spot. And I know you said that about Atlanta. It, it's technically not over uh, between you know the Hawks and the Mavs here. You know, the Mavs. Let's see, they've got four games left. The Hawks have three. Atlanta could win out, and the Mavs could lose out. And the Mavs would have sole possession of the fifth best odds. So, you know that the yeah. likelihood of the likelihood of that happening is not very good. But you know, it, there's still a chance there. Well, it could have happened, Dalton. 
but <laughs> look, know. I'm I'm sorry that you know the the Golden State win and the Cleveland win, and they <laughs> they had to go on a uh, a very timely uh, a timely win streak here lately when they beat the, the and they've Philadelphia. Been... <laughs> And they've been putting out garbage starting lineups, too. Like, Luka didn't play in two of those wins. It's like, what the hell, man? Well, like, like I said, there's only so much you control. You know? No, I the, know. If it's the just, Mavs... It's, it's not the Mavericks I'm mad at, like I said. It's the other teams. Yeah. I mean, if the Mavs go out this weekend and they start Silot at point guard, and, you know, the Grizzlies just let him go off for a monster triple-double or something just completely ridiculous like that... You can't even blame the Mavs for winning a game like that. <laughs> like Dude, their the other... their starting lineup against Memphis better be first of all, Luca better have a quote unquote hip contusion or hip pain or something. And second of all, they their starting lineup needs to be Daryl Macon, Ryan Brokoff, Costas Antetokounmpo, uh, Dirk, and Salah. <laughs> and they need to play forty minutes each. Well, and another thing that kind of hurts is uh, Jonas Valanciunas is out for the the rest of the season for the Grizz, so that's a big loss for them there. But uh, hold on just a second. Let this thunder get done thundering. Yeah, Stalton's experiencing thunder in the great state of Mississippi. God, it's so bad. It's been raining all day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. All right. I think it. I, I think it's calmed down now. <laughs> okay. You gonna you gonna survive? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think. I think not I'm gonna, gonna survive. Not gonna float away. <laughs> if I do, just let me know what happens in the lottery and everything. Yeah, I'll try. All right. So, and, and like you said before, the Grizzlies, they ideally want to convey their pick uh, to Boston, and with the sixth through ninth spots being as open as they are you know that's that's very likely because uh, what they they need to be eighth to convey the pick to boston uh eighth? yeah i think so i think it's eighth yes okay yeah so i mean that you you the grizz have more to to play for if they want that to happen um so that that could work in the Mavs' favor but we'll see i mean we got a we got those two games coming up this weekend. Then, obviously, we've got the home finale, which uh, they're going to treat it like it's Dirk's last, even though he hasn't made a formal announcement. And then they'll they'll finish off the season in San Antonio. So there's a lot coming up. Uh, we're going to keep you guys updated on Twitter. Uh, if, you, if you're not already, you can find me on Twitter at Dalton underscore Trig. And then you can find Matt at Matt Galatson. Uh, we'll keep you updated on everything happening with the Mavs, you know, in between weeks, we do this podcast once a week. And, uh, if you want to get a little bit of insight on what we're thinking beforehand, you can always look at our Twitter feeds and, uh, get some stuff there, but, uh, that'll do it for this week. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming on and listening as always, like you do. Um, uh, we're going to keep you updated going into the weekend and going into next week. Matt, any last words? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say we've got some really good pieces out on uh, DallasBasketball.com. Uh, Fish has uh, a story um, about Mark Cuban and how the Mavs did not turn a blind eye to the Porzingis issue. It's a great read. Go check that out. Uh, he also has a game recap, and it goes into the Porzingis stuff a little bit as well um, up on the site. And, and Matthew Poston's uh, one of our other guys has a great set of donuts up and TJ's got her great piece about semantics and Porzingis and we just got a whole bunch of stuff that's really great right now so go go check it all out when you can yeah we have a lot of great stuff on DallasBasketball.com uh, we're trying to give you the best Mavs content possible whether you're listening to it or whether you're reading it so uh, stay with us on there and uh, we'll be back next week to do a season recap on the Mavs and we'll look forward to the draft lottery so again guys we appreciate it be sure to like follow and subscribe to our podcast and we'll see you next week y'all have a good one
know the man's the best on the floor. I'm wild, but yeah, I'm the goat. This gang get cold. Yeah, you might need a coach. Your friends turn into your foe. But I'ma just roll. Gotta keep rolling your boat. Yeah, I swear I give them hope. I say I'm cleaner than the soap. This time of year proves who a really single float for Yeah, real. it's the Mavericks. All about action. Don't do no action. No Samuel Jackson. Dirk at the ball. You know that it's magic. Post move deadly. Yeah, get tragic. Yeah, it's the Mavericks. All about action. Don't do no action. No Samuel Jackson. Dirk at the ball. You know that it's magic. Post move deadly. Yeah, get tragic. You know, in this game, it's a lot of grit, you know what I'm saying? Proves who has integrity. Late nights, early mornings, but we all want the trophy at the end of the day. And that's the beauty of this game, because at the end of the day, only the real gonna float, man, for real. You either sink or you float, only the real gonna float.